This is a psalm that's going to be found in the book of Numbers, chapter number 16. If you go to Numbers, chapter number 16, there was a group of people that had rose up against Moses. And they said that Moses had become a dictator and that Moses wanted to kill all the Israelites and he was, he was unable to reach the promised land. And so Moses goes to God because he's troubled by the accusations that are being brought against him. And he asks God to intervene. And he, he, he comes out after he talks with the Lord and he, and he tells this crowd, he says, listen, why don't you bring incense unto the tabernacle and offer it unto the Lord? But here's what God did. God rejected this group of Israelites. He rejected these people. And then number 16, the Bible talks about how after Moses prayed that the ground opened up and swallowed these people up into the fire of hell. This is the story this morning in Psalm 88 of Korah. And it is the cries and the prayers of Korah as they slipped off into hell. God, through His sovereign mercy and His grace, He allowed these words to be recorded to where we can read them this morning. Some would call Psalm 88 a psalm from hell because it's what they prayed as they slipped off into eternity. And I often thought about the prayer that was offered in Psalm 88 because it sounds great. Matter of fact, there's nothing wrong with the prayer that was prayed. And I really believe with all of my heart, people in hell have a better prayer life than we have. Luke 16 said, and the rich man cried. Said, Abraham, that he may testify of my brethren that they ought not come to this awful place of torment. I mean, they're soul winners in hell. I mean, you, you go to hell, there's people in hell with a burden this morning. There's people with a, with, a, with a prayer life that they've never had before. The problem is God's a thousand miles from their cries. I call this, it's the, it's, it's the, it's the right prayer in the wrong place. God help us not to get to the place where we pray too late. Because there's going to come a point in time in everybody's life when we slip off into eternity. And, it's going, and, and, pray, and sweet our prayer is going to be done away with for the saved and the lost. But especially for the lost man. Notice his confidence that he has in verse number 1. He comes boldly to the throne of grace. He says, O Lord of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. There's the confidence that he's coming before the Lord of my salvation. I mean, he's got the Lord right. The salvation is correctly placed. It's only the Lord that can save. Man can't save himself. It's only God that can save. It's only the Lord that can do the saving. And he said, I've cried before thee day and night. That's the continual prayer. You know what the Bible says, that we are how we are to pray, don't you? It says we are to pray without ceasing. And, the, and, and, here he, and here he's saying, I've cried before thee day and night before thee. Look at verse number 9. He said, I have called daily upon thee. I stretched out my hands unto thee. I'm talking about a man that's got a faithful, continual, confident prayer life. Problem is, it's the right prayer in the wrong place. Listen at the confession he makes. Verse number 3 said, For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. Verse number 4, For I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. Free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Verse 15, I'm afflicted and ready to die from my youth up while I suffer the terrors. I am distracted. So what he's doing is he's given his confession before God. The problem is it's too late. Amen. 
It's, it's too late to call on God. It's too late to pray to God. It's too late to be continuing in your prayer and confident in your prayer and confessing in your prayer. It's too late for all that. Look at verse number 9. He said, My eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I've called daily upon thee, and I've stretched out my hands unto thee. I'm talking about, he said, my eye has mourned. He said, listen, pray until the tears have dried up. I think there's conviction in hell. There's people who want to get right with God in hell. Problem is, God's a thousand miles from there. And he, he and, and here's the, here's the consideration verses tw uh, verse number ten through thirteen. Listen to what he says: Wilt thou show wonders to the dead, and shall the dead rise and praise thee? Shall thy loving kindness be declared unto the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Think, think about the consideration that he's making. The, here, here, here's a man that's got great confidence, great continual prayer, great confession, great conviction, and, and he's even considering the possibilities of what God may do. He, he's optimistic. Problem is he's optimistic in hell. He prayed knowing that God would never answer him, but yet he prayed anyway. We can't even get people to pray knowing God could answer. This guy's in hell praying, knowing God will never answer, but yet he's praying. There's a lot of people praying in hell. Verse number six, I'm talking about this is a prayer that is a that is a courage-filled prayer. He said, Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness and in the depths, and thy wrath is lying hard upon me. I'm being afflicted, I'm in torments, I'm in pain. And yet, while in hell, he's still praying. We got folk who won't even pray at church. <laughs> they won't pray at home, they won't pray in their car, they won't even pray over their food. But there's people, there's people in hell this morning that are praying. And they're talking to God. The problem is, God's a thousand miles from Psalm 88. It's too late. It's the right prayer, and I find nothing wrong with it. The problem is, bro, they're, 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 they're praying in the wrong place. They, they should have had this prayer life before they were swallowed up into hell. They should, they should have had this prayer life before God poured out His wrath and His judgment. They, they should have prayed this while God still had mercy and kindness and, and tender mercies. And, and He knew all about the marvelous, wonderful work. Think about the things God did for Korah that they saw God do. How God led them out of Egypt. How God took them and let them peek into the promised land. Think about that. They got to see the grapes. They got to see the promised land. They got to see how God destroyed Pharaoh and his army. They got to see how God took the bitter waters of Marah and made them sweet. They got to see the water coming out of the rock, manna coming out of heaven, and the bread in the morning, and quail in the evening, meat in the evening. They saw God do many wonderful works, but yet they still rejected God. <laughs> They should have had faith here, not there. They should have had confidence here, not there. I'm going to give you a couple of things this morning out of this passage of Scripture, and I'm going to lay them on your heart. And you just think about them. Hell's a place, number one, of unanswered prayers. Unanswered prayers. Watch what he says. O oh Lord, verse number one, my God, I have cried unto thee day and night. Let my prayer come before thee and incline thine ear unto my, unto my cry. He said, for I'm full of trouble. Mine eye mourneth, Lord, I have called for thee daily upon thee, and I've stretched out my hands unto thee. God, will you please show me your wonders? Will, you sh will, will, you, will the dead arise and praise thee? Can you show me loving kindness beyond the grave? God, are you able to show me wonders and righteousness? God, is there any, God, can you do anything for me at all? And all you hear is prayers. All you hear is their cries. All you hear is their petitions, but you never hear God answer. You never hear God reply. 
That's what's so scary because in this life, we've got one chance to get this thing right. We got one chance. That's it. God deals with your heart. God speaks to your heart. God illuminates the scriptures. You open your eyes. God opens your mind. You open your eyes and you accept him as Lord and Savior. And there's that 180 degree turn to repentance and you turn your life around. And that's when we see God start to do things. The first prayer God ever answered for me was when I said, Lord, save me. Amen. That was the, fir that was the first prayer he ever answered. There's a lot of people this morning that are praying and they're crying, God save me. Is there any tender mercies? Is there any kindness? Is there any grace? Is there any love? Is there any, God, is there anything you can do? And every prayer is unanswered throughout all of eternity. The Bible calls it the bottomless pit. Think about that. You're always constantly falling in hell. You're all, it's, it's, it's never a state of stability. It's always unanswered. It's always unseemingly. And I'm telling you, that is where they are at this morning in Psalm 88 is they're crying out in hell and God is, is, is nowhere to be found to hear these prayers. They can't find help. They can't find God's ear. They can't find God. Listen, they have nobody to look for them. They're lost eternally. It's a place of unanswered prayers, but it's a place of unending pain. Look, if you would, at verse number three, he said, For my soul is full of troubles. That word trouble means to be in misery, to be in pain, to be injured, to be hurt. That evil that comes upon, I'm telling you, when God pours out his wrath and his judgment and God pours out his anger, I'm going to tell you something, that, that's the best way to put it. He said, My soul is filled with trouble. He said, I'm gone down into the grave. That word grave is where we find the Old Testament word sheol, which is the pit, which is hell, which is the underworld, the place of no return, the place of no exile, the place of no exit signs. I'm, I'm telling you, you know, people say, well, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to have a barbecue and have a good time. Listen, it's a, Jesus it talked about hell more than he did heaven, and he's the one that said it was a place of outer darkness. It's a place where the worm dieth not. He said it's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's an unending pain. It's unending. Verse number four, he says, For I'm counted with them that go down in the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. I'm going to tell you something. Even the kings, even the queens, and the mighty ones, and the strong men, and those that were on this earth, and they thought they were somebody, and they thought they were something. I'm going to tell you something. When they get into hell, there's no strength in hell. Korah thought they knew better than Moses. Korah thought they knew better than God. And where did it end them? It ended them in hell. There's no strength in hell. There's no, there's no abilities in hell. There's no getting your way out, climbing your way out, crying your way out. Verse number 7, he talks about the affliction. He said, thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. It Literally, one wave after God's wrath. One wave after another after God's judgment in, in a place called hell. I'm going to tell you something. One of, the, one of the most powerful messages I ever heard preached on hell was by a missionary. He came to our church. This has been years and years ago. He was a missionary in, in Africa. And he came by and he said, my mom died without God. And he said, I, I heard her as she was trying to kick out of the flames when she died. She died and she went to hell. And he said, Mama is in hell today and she's screaming and she's crying and she's asking God to send me to Africa. And he said, I don't know if you can hear her this morning. He said, but Mama wants me to go tell somebody about Jesus. And I'll never forget what he did. He got everybody real quiet and he got down on the platform and he put his ears to the ground. And he said, can you hear my mom screaming? She's in hell. Will somebody please go tell them? Powerful message. Talk about an unending pain. Look what he said in verse number 9. He said, For I've called daily upon thee, and I've stretched out my hands. My eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something. There's no tears in hell because there's no water in hell. No water. Verse 15, eternally confused. I'm afflicted and ready to die from my youth while I suffer thy terrors and I'm distracted. 
There's no strength in hell. There's no, there, there, there is no uh, uh, clarity in hell. He's eternally confused. He talks about the second death. Thou hast put mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made an abomination unto them, and I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. I want to tell you, it's a place of unending pain. So I don't believe in hell. Well, I do. Jesus said there's a hell. <laughs> Amen. Jesus said there's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. He talks about his fear. Verse 16, his fierce and his wrath has gone over me. He said, thy terrors have cut me off. I said it this morning on Facebook. I really believe this with all my heart. If your salvation isn't good enough, good, good, enough, good enough to get you out of the bed on Sunday morning to a house of God, is it really going to be good enough to get you out of the grave come resurrection morning? That's exactly right. I'm talking, I'm talking having the right prayer. The problem is it's the wrong place. It's the wrong place. It's a place of unanswered prayers. It's a place of unending pain. But it's a place of unforgivable. It's unforgivable. Verse number 10, watch what he cries out. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Are you kidding me? It's an unforgivable place because the, the wonders of God are gone. The loving kindness of God is gone. The faithfulness of God is gone. The righteousness of God is gone. The grace of God is gone. They're all gone. The psalmist said it's by the mercies of God that we're not consumed daily. Look at verse number 18. He said, lover and friend, Hast thou put far from me and thy, and mine acquaintance into darkness? It, it's an unforgivable place, but I'm going to tell you something. This it, Listen, it's, it is an undeserving place to be. You'll never see your family again. Friends again. They're, they're put far, far from you. Listen at this, Matthew chapter number 25. If you got your Bibles, let's look at Matthew 25. It's an undeserved persecution. Look at verse number 41. Matthew chapter number 25. Jesus said this. Jesus said, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Listen, prepared for who? The devil. And his angels. Hell was, hell was not a place that was created for me and you. <laughs> you die and go to hell, you're trespassing. Hell is a place for the devil and the, and, and the devil's angels. Yeah. The, the demonic, that's, that's what hell's for. But I'm going to tell you something. People have been sent strong delusion that they would believe a lie. And when they open their eyes, it's going to be a shock and awe in eternity. They'll close their eyes in death here, and they'll open their eyes there, and there won't be no mercy, and there won't be no help, and there won't be no grace, and there won't be no love, there won't be no kindness, and they'll wonder, how in the world did I get here? The problem is it'll be too late. But I can tell you, according to this scripture that we read this morning, you're going to have a great prayer life. Because people in hell, they know how to pray. They know how to pray for their loved ones. They know how to pray for their friends, their family. They know how to pray for one another. They know how to pray for themselves. And they know all the right words to say. And they, they know how to talk to God. The problem is, it's just, it, it's the right prayer. It's just in the wrong place. I say, God, give us the prayer life of people that are in hell. God, give, give, us, give us the vision of people that are in hell. I mean, people in hell, listen, they're soul winners. They want to make a change. They want to make a difference. The problem is it's too late. 
it's too late. <laughs> there was a cardiologist. I heard this story this week. It's really set, set on my heart, and I've thought about it. And I, I don't know if any of you has ever been to a cardiologist or not. I guess at, at some point or another, we're all going to have to go get our tickers looked at and we'll figure out if we're going to make it another week or two. But this cardiologist was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He, 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 he works in Chattanooga, Tennessee, still is a doctor to this day. And he had this guy, and he came in. This was this was a few years ago. And he came in, and uh, he put him on the treadmill. And the guy started walking, and he was going to try to get his heart rate up, and he was going to check to see what's going on. And uh, the cardiologist said that he took and gave the guy the medication, and, and the guy started walking on the treadmill. And literally, while he was on the treadmill in the doctor's office, he collapsed and flatlined and died. The doctor said that he fell over in the floor. He immediately grabbed his nurses come in there. They grabbed the, the crash cart. They begin to jolt him back and brought this guy back to life. And that doctor said that the, they said that man, when he looked up at that doctor, he said he reached up and he grabbed his coat. The doctor said he grabbed my coat and he said the fear that was in his eyes, he said, I've never seen anything like it. And he said he screamed and said, don't let me die. I'm burning and the doctor said what he said it could, could it be the medication could it be something we just gave him maybe he's talking about the electricity we used to to bring him back and he said my feet are burning don't let me die i'm gonna go to hell keep me alive and the doctor said he went right back out he said they immediately went, and he said they started trying to bring him, resuscitate him, bring him back to. He said that the, the nurses got him to come back to and said he was letting off a blood-hurling scream and said, Doctor, he said, I'm telling you, he said, I need you to pray for me right now. He said, I'm burning in hell. I need you to pray for me right now. And that doctor in all of his pride and his arrogancy and his, all of his doctor's degrees, he thought, how dare this person ask me to, he needs a preacher I, i'm not a i'm I, I lean more towards science and not the spiritual and he said I'm, I'm not one to give any kind of advice on prayer how to pray i don't even go to church and i don't even know god and i can care less about church and the things of god and he said but man the guy had tears rolling out of his eyes he said doctor please tell me what to say tell me what to pray he said i'm gonna die and i'm gonna die and i'm gonna burn in hell And he said, while I was sitting there in my white coat, and he said, that man was hanging on to me, and he said he was shaking because his, his body was burning. He said, all he could think of was when he was in Sunday school as a little kid, they said, call upon Jesus and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And that doctor got down on the floor with that man and said, I don't know. He said, I don't go to church, and I don't know God. And said, the guys are screaming at him. And he said, why don't you just ask Jesus to forgive you and to call on him and ask him to save you? It said that man got said that man was sitting there and while they're still working on him, he said he cried out to God. He said, God, be merciful unto me and save me. And God changed my heart, changed my life. And you know, he got up. He somehow they did open heart surgery. The guy lived through it. But that it shook that doctor to the core. He never got over that. And he went back and he went back home and he found that old family Bible that he had and he blew the dust off of it. And he started reading the Bible and God started working in his heart and God started working in that doctor's life. And did you know that doctor, he got saved and he got born again and he asked God to come in his life and he even wrote a book about his experience where he connected the scientific to the spiritual. He said, it happened in my office. He said, hell's real. And he said, God sent that man in to witness to me. I heard that story this week and I thought to myself, man, it sounds like that crowd that died and went to hell when God opened up the earth and God was able to record those prayers of Korah as they slipped off. It's real. And we're not promised next week. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised the next breath. There's Listen, there's only one thing that separates me and you this morning from eternity, and that's one pump of our heart.
one tick and we're gone. That's how frail life is. One tick and we're out in eternity. So I'm, uh, and, and once we get to the other side, there is no coming back and praying. It's over.